the Naji coffee shop, which we're starting here. Absolutely not the approved method. So as you can see, this is a bit sort of Heath Robinson, which is really stupid. I guess that answers that question then, doesn't it? I'm not apologizing for the lights yet. I shall ring Jeff Bezos personally. That was a good job I didn't cut it because that's still live. Yo guys, what's going on? We love you. Just too much effort, man. Yeah, don't break them again, Tom. So Tom, if you're watching this, just click off a minute there. Truth is, Tom's actually bald. I'm gonna leak a photo up on the screen now. I go, where do you want me to go, man? Everybody, welcome back. Thank you for tuning back in. This is Naji Weekly episode eight. It is eight. It is, it's eight, yes. <laughs> Thank you for tuning back in. We do appreciate it. Uh, before we go any further, if you like the content during the course of the video, hit subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell icon and give us a like because it really does make a difference. We've got these, um, uh, obviously we're going on from the, the Naji coffee shop, which we're starting here. So we've got our full display of coffee now, it's coffee syrups. So we've gone for chocolate mint, vanilla, salted caramel, hazelnut cinnamon and chocolate. So it's a little start, um, but this actually, in, on a serious note, this goes back to what I was saying in uh, last week's video, which I want to get to in a second, because it is trying to make an effort to try to give everybody who works here a little bit of something they like and just try to keep that going. A couple of you were talking about, because you noticed that I was getting these uh, little porridge pots from Tesco and you were saying, why don't you go to Costco? A lot of you were saying that, that came up quite a number of times. Uh, we have, we've now got a Costco trade account or trade exec, an executive, I don't know, it's like a trade account, but we have got that now. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody who was saying that. And it is dirt cheap. You can buy like uh, 24, 24 bottles of that, I think it was like seven quid. It was really cheap. And like, you go to Tesco, that's like two pound that bottle. So it's, it is super, super cheap. So yeah, in the grand scheme of things, we were talking about cost in that video. You know, the cost of it here is actually, you know, it on the, in the scheme of things, it's negligible, but it really does make a difference. So we've got M&Ms, we decided to put the M&Ms, cereal wasn't working. So we've decided to put M&Ms in one of them, but we were thinking maybe Skittles, and Smarties in the other two. What's a good dispensing chocolate? Put it below, what's a good dispensing? We're thinking Skittles, Smarties, it's like a confectionery. But on a serious note, uh, in last week's video, thank you to everybody who was commenting. I've tried to reply to as many as I can, but I've got work to do as well. So I'm trying to balance it between all of you uh, and what I've got to do here. But a big thank you to everybody because uh, it is nice to know you're not alone. There are other people who are also, a lot of you reached out on Instagram actually, I'll leave uh, Instagram here. Uh, there were a lot of you sending videos and stuff um, just explaining your own situation. And it's surprising how many of you actually are in similar situations, trying to grow, trying to break that, that barrier to get a bit bigger. Um, so a big thank you to all of you. Right, now we're just heading out on a breakdown. So I, need to do, I don't know actually all the details. It's got something to do with a forklift that's not working or something. I don't know. I'm gonna, we're going to go out there together and we'll go and have a look. But before I do that, I've got a job which I'm working on later in the week. And I, sometimes these cheaper products do tickle my... I've got to scratch the old curiosity edge. And this is apparently a 100 watt floodlight. Now, I'm gonna plug it in later on to see whether it does actually pull 100 watts. But I think it was 30 quid a fitting, so they're not, you know, not expensive. But it turned up, and I tell you what, it actually looks like a quite a nicely well-made fitting. It feels really substantial. Um, I'll leave a link for it below. I mean, obviously I haven't tried it yet, but uh, I'll update you later in the week once I've got it plugged in and I'll let you know how much wattage it actually does pull. But let me get in the truck and I'll see you down there. So as you can see, this is a bit sort of Heath Robinson, the way we've had to set this up. And I'd like to point out that this is strictly an off the books job. A few health and safety issues here, as you, as you can, I mean, if you ignore the spring rolls and the prawn crackers, basically what happened is the client here has basically run this forklift out of battery. And I think they've, they've accidentally left it on and the batteries are so deeply discharged that when you plug it into the machine, the machine's not even registering the batteries. So, you know, like sometimes when you put a 12 volt, like a lead acid on a charger, sometimes it doesn't even recognize there's a battery there because it's so low. I've never actually had to deal with this first time I've done it. You can't move the forklift. You can't just put it in neutral and roll it. Cause when I got here, the forklift ran out here, but the charger is all the way back there. So I said, well, that's easy. Just, just pop it in neutral and all of us will just push it, but you can't. It's, 
Like, even when you put it in neutral, it's locked to the motor somehow. You can't, there's no neutral, so you can't drag it around. And I think what Barlow do, this company, I imagine when you ring them and say, look, my forklift's run out of juice, I need to charge it up somehow. I've got a feeling they probably come out in a big work truck and they've probably got like a 48 volt power pack, which they'll just plug in to the power port just there. So essentially what we've had to do, and it's very Heath Robinson, but there was just no, we've got to move this forklift today because other vehicles got to come in. So what we've had to do is take the cover off the charger out there manually turn on the contactor to force it to start charging the batteries. If you do that for like just 10 seconds, it puts enough charge into the batteries so that when you reconnect it, it then registers that there's batteries there and it just, it just knows they're very discharged. Sometimes you get that on um, double A's. You know, when you put them in the charger when they're really deeply discharged with your chargeable ones, sometimes if you just take a fully charged one, and just connect it manually to a, a, a flat one just for 10 seconds or so. Then when you put it back in the charger, it registers it. Same sort of thing here. So all we're gonna do, this is only a very temporary just to get like just 10 minutes of charge into the batteries because there's a lot of current flowing here. So this is literally just to get 10 minutes into the batteries. We're gonna disconnect it now and that should be enough juice, even though it'll be very low. It's enough just to push it over to the charge pod. Yeah, I was carrying quite a lot of juice gives you a gauge. These are 48 volts. So basically on the back of a forklift, this is off now, mind. On the back of a forklift, you've got, wow, that was, that was warm. You've basically got two, four, four, eight, 12, 16, 20. You've got 24, 24 batteries and each battery is two volts. But the batteries are literally the entire depth. I come around this side. They are huge. I mean, they're massive batteries. They're incredible, they're tall batteries. So you've got two volts each and they're all just wired in series to make up the 48 volts that you need to power the forklift. So what we've had to do is disconnect the lead here and we had a couple of uh, M8 bolts which happens to fit perfectly just to thread them in so we can manually charge it up. Absolutely not the approved method but this client is in a real pinch so he was very thankful for us coming out to give him a hand. So. Just taking it off the charger for a sec. So that's the original lead that was plugged onto the batteries. I'd like to point out, all right, this is not how we operate every day, all right? But you know what it's like when a client's in a tight spot, you work with the equipment you've got to get the job done. And we just need to get 10 minutes of charging to the forklift. Just so, all we've got to do, just enough charge in it, just to get the, the mechanism underneath to unlock. And then you can start moving it again because all we've got to do now is put it in neutral and now you can just roll it, but you need the, the batteries have to have a bit of charge in it to enable that to happen. So let me plug this back in and we'll, uh, we'll see if my theory's right. So what's happened is put it all back down, set it all up again, and there just wasn't quite enough charge in it to get it to unlock. So what we're going to do now, the only permanent solution that will work overnight, if I had, an, if I had another 175 amp Anderson connector, that'd be perfect, but we haven't got that. So all I'm gonna do is just bolt these using the existing bolts straight back onto the battery and then we can just leave it overnight. He can just disconnect it in the more. I'm talking so loud over those noisy <laughs> chip <laughs> Oh Basically we're hooking it back up again. <sighs> okay, another day, another set of issues, but the same positivity. So we are actually on a house. We do quite a bit of work here. They've got these driveway lights, which um, are Bega or Bega, depending how you pronounce it. And they're very good, but they are extortionately overpriced in my opinion. They're just hugely expensive. So one of them has failed. These have been in actually, to be fair, for quite a while. And one of them has failed because it's tripping the RCD. And it ain't that one. What happens is you have a sleeve. It's like a plastic sleeve that goes in and you're supposed to have a drain out at the bottom so when water gets in, they, it can drain through. And this one's dry inside, so I highly doubt it's this one. So I'm gonna go around some of the others and we'll pull them out and eventually you'll find one which is full of water. I've always been a believer that when you do things like driveway lighting and stuff, you've got to put a duct in, you have to put runs in between the lights. You've got to be able to make that cabling underneath accessible because trying to run a new cable from light to light is just not possible, especially when you've got you know, beautiful stones like this. Once, once that cabling is in, you need to be able to get to it. And here, they haven't. All that's happened is you've got like a high tough. It's like a blue, it's not even high tough, it's just a blue flex that's been run in underground, but they've just run it straight in the ground by the looks of it. You can't even replace it. Or maybe it's in some sort of a, a little bit of pipe or something, but it's certainly not replaceable. If you pull on it, 
you just can't you can't pull on it there's no you you can't replace it this is a non-serviceable cable you can't really replace you can undo that but you can't replace the cable this these fittings are designed not really to be main you can't there's no user serviceable parts inside is what i'm saying i had to disconnect them to do my insulation testing so what I ended up doing, I cut it and I put these waterproof boxes on, these gel boxes, and these are great. It's not an ideal solution, but if you can't replace a cable, what do you do? I just pulled these out to see if there's any water inside, but all of these are dry. And these little boxes, this is not the ideal way to do it, like I say, but again, when you're trying to rectify somebody else's, you know, dog workmanship, you can only do what you can do with the, you know, with what you're presented with, you know. But these are brilliant if no one's ever used these. You get them in much bigger versions, these with these snap-over boxes. It's just a cover. You just open it up, put your cable inside, wedge it shut, put a zip tie around it, and that's it. But you can see there's no water in there. That's full of gel. And there's no condensation under these light fittings, which leads me to believe is probably a fault under the driveway, which wouldn't surprise me because they've just run it in flex. So I'm going to have to go and break that news to the lady. The fundamental issue here is that all of these fittings have only got one wire coming up out the ground, which must mean that somewhere every single fitting under the ground has a junction box, which is just, it's such a dumb way of wiring. Why would you do that? You know, you have a, you have a junction box and you run a flex up to, I see why it's for convenience of fitting the, the, the down light or the up lighter in this case. But you've got, a, you've got some sort of box under the ground you're never going to be able to get to. It's just the dumbest way of work. Why would you do that? Because that's none of these fittings have taken all of them off. They're all okay. So it's a fault on the cabling under the ground. But I mean, you've got all of these papers. You're, you're never going to be able to get to it now. So what do you say to the customer now? You just turn around and say, look, sorry. You know, there's a fault on the cabling underground. The only way you're going to be able to repair that now is to... A, you start lifting these up. There's just no other way of doing it. And she's not going to do that. So she just can't have driveway lights anymore, which is really stupid. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be able to say that to a client. But what else, you know, it's not the fittings. I've taken all these bezels off and they're dry inside, completely dry. Mm. Schlepp's been here. Oh, well. <laughs> it's really cold. We've got a floodlight here in this tree. In fact, it was the one which I showed you the other day, that one. So they want something to light up the inside of the tree. It does look stunning. I've seen it before when there was a light. There used to be a light in this tree lighting it up at night and it does look ace when it's on. So I'm gonna put this one in. I'll be curious to see how long it lasts. So I'll keep you posted on it. But the ones that were in the unit, on the roof of the unit, you know, those, they were like, like a tent. I mean, they were dirt cheap, those ones on Amazon. They're still going and those are on for like, 12 hours a day now in fact longer than that 13 14 15 hours now because it's dark and they're on a photo cell but that's still i mean they're trucking on absolutely fine so it's it does go to show it's not you know there is a there is a, a thing that you know anything that's cheap is you know garbage it's not always the case this is supposed to be a 100 watt floodlight so we'll see i'm going to wire this up now and we'll turn it on and have a look i guess that answers that question then doesn't it piece of shit the problem is it's really hard trying to find a warm white floodlight because normally floodlights that you buy are just cool white they're like five and a half six and a half k i can't believe that's got a flicker from factory frog snacks the flicker is you should be able to pick that up through the camera i'd have thought but the problem is i'm trying to look for brands where you can get a warm white floodlight i can't find any i know Osram did one but it was like they only do a 10 watt floodlight i need something really bright to light this tree up but they want it in warm white Right, just to test the theory whether it is a dodgy floodlight. I didn't know whether it was a dodgy connection, so we've got a high tough here. But the problem is, all of these boxes, you've got to fill them with gel. You just can't, you can't leave boxes without gel because water just, it gets in. Doesn't matter how hard you try not to, it does get in. So I have another one of these floodlights. That was me praising it. If I swap this over and it works, I'm going to be not happy. Is that all right now? Ah, oh, you what? That can't be another dodgy thing. That has to be a cabling issue then. I'm not apologising for the lights yet, because they could, that wouldn't, uh, it can't, it, that can't be too, it's not possible. The power comes from this junction box, but that light is on solid, so it has to be a loose connection, or it's two faulty lights. Right, let me take this junction box off and have a look. I've unplugged that one, the second one. It, I highly doubt it's two faulty floodlights, but I could be wrong. Check that junction box there, and that's full of gel. That, all those connections are static connections. They won't have moved. 
and the light next to it is on solidly so I know it's not it's not a supply issue there so what I'm going to do plug this 50 watt floodlight into here if this one is not flickering then it's two faulty units and I shall take I shall ring Jeff Bezos personally <laughs> I'm like Jeff get your ass over to Hampstead right now this is unacceptable send one of your donnies over here right now S sorry Tom <laughs> I'm on the way old boy a few inches later you could probably see flickering on the screen from this light but that's not this isn't actually flickering it is actually okay <laughs> cheap Chinese shit problem is it is really hard to buy warm white floodlights i tried in um i went to city electrical the other day they said no nah, sorry we don't stock them they just cool white is what generally are floodlights but of course when you're trying to do decorative lighting in the garden you don't want a cool white floodlight you want warm that is really crap how can the quality control on something be so poor because i actually i said i mean i'd never fit in them i said earlier in the video they seem really nicely made they actually seem weighty they seem really good but both of them have got horrendous flicker. That is really appallingly bad. At this point, I would call out the brand name, but there isn't one on it, so speaks volumes. Right, two minutes, let me put this floodlight in there and I'll be back in a sec. If only you could feel the cold through the TV. You need like a seat which has got hot and cold in it and somehow it makes you feel it through the TV. I don't know how that would be possible, but that's what is needed. I've got my heater jacket on and it is helping. It's, they are really good, but it's cold. And it's like you can't do it and when it's so cold everything turns so brittle like whisker boxes and everything becomes so hard to you know the simplest job just because <laughs> it just becomes so difficult but anyway the point of this this is a led driver is a 150 watt driver which is feeding an led strip which runs all the way down this garden and i've got a feeling it's either the driver's died i know it's not the led strip but i think it's the driver pack yeah, one of the problems with um, some types of driver, and all LED is one of them. All LED is exceptional, they're really good products. The one really irritating thing they do though, is they have a minimum, they have like a cut off voltage. So some drivers will be like from 100 volts up to 250. Their ones are from 220 to 240, which on paper is fine. But when you're using them with things like Lutron dimmers and stuff, or V-Pro dimmers or anything like that, the problem you get is that when you turn a dimmer switch right up, you don't actually get 250, you get like 220, which is right on the minimum cutoff voltage that, that driver can, can operate on. So they end up just not turning on, which I think might be what's happening here. So once I can figure out how to get into this whisker box, we'll test the voltage and we'll see what, because uh, I know if it's literally 218 volts or 219 volts, it's, it's very finely tuned and they just won't turn on anything less than 220 they won't turn on the reason i know this is because i've had that on another job and in the end i had to find another brand it was like knightsbridge or something and that that had from like i think it was 150 to 250 volts it was a much wider spectrum this is what i'm on about with boxes with water in even if we're using flexes water just condensation it just manages to get in it's uh incredible how water gets in so that's why i'm saying when you use whisker boxes just every single time without fail just fill them with gel and it just stops so many issues with garden lighting excellent that's a faulty driver pack unusual i've actually never had an oil led driver pack fail i've never had that that's the first time i've seen that all right let me put that back in the box properly and we'll move on to the next job yeah so that is the old oil led driver pack I've never ever had one fail. It's the first time I've ever had that. Unusual, because it's not actually, that's a 150 watt driver. And it's only running about 120 watts. So there is a little bit of headroom there. I'm not running it at absolutely full capacity. But anyway, I'm gonna gel these boxes up. So for anybody who's never used this stuff, there's a couple of different brands, but that's, that's one of the ones we use, um, which just, whisk, I call it whisker gel. And essentially you get a little beaker I've actually reused this, which I'll explain in a second, but basically you get a blue, you get a blue gel and a white gel, a clear gel. The, the problem is with this stuff, you've got to measure off roughly what you need. So here, for instance, I've, I only need a little bit. So, and it's so expensive. This is like 40 quid. This here, one liter is 40 quid roughly. So you really don't want to use more than, I'm going to start with that 100 mil of each. Let's go with that. I'm going to use a screw fix pencil. 
and then you mix it up. This bit you've got to be quite quick because it turns to rubber very, very fast. So you just give it a good mix and then you literally just pour it straight over your connections. Normally splurges out when you put the cover back on, like so, but that's absolutely fine. It's quite messy, but it is excellent stuff. And that is a totally sealed unit now. All right, one final job. A couple of these lamps have gone. If you look back there, you'll see the armoured we put in last year. So it's just an armoured with a, a wire box. You've just got an armoured coming in and out, stuffing gland flex out to your light fittings here. The lamp may have failed. They're not working, so I'll pop a new lamp in. Again, when you put these four screws in, I put, you know that copper slip I use? Always put a little bit of copper slip on. This has actually still got, this has still got on from last time, which is why they come out so easily. Normally when you see contractors, you skip that, these round out, and then you've just got to change the whole fitting. And then when you tighten them up, op do opposites. Imagine you're doing a head gasket and you're putting the cylinder head back on. Always tighten them up, opposites. Don't go clockwise because the seal won't, or it won't always seal down correctly. If you go opposite, you get a nice even compression. I have no way of knowing if this is live without testing it here. That was a good job I didn't cut it because that's still live. Right, now back in a minute. Still 240. I think it is this one. <laughs> no, it's not. Do you want to turn the whole board off? Yes, we are setting up alert PIR. Right, let's go to a quiet corner. I'll just extend the time out because I just want to see how long it actually stays on for. It's a couple of minutes, I think. So to go through the gate to the front door. Then once I've done this, I'm going to go back to the office and that's long enough. I'll see what uh, what paperwork Sarah's got for me, I guess. Yo guys, what's going on? We love that you're back here. We're here on a Friday in the workshop. We've had our coffee syrup. We're high. We love you. Likes. Just too much effort, man. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much effort. <laughs> All right, we are going back to that house rewire that you saw in some previous content. I don't think we're going to, I'll take a GoPro, but I don't think we're going to get much content there today. Um, so James is going to take over because he is with the camera guy for the rest of the day. I'm going to head over to this house rewire and we will catch you later on back here in the shop. Okay, it's a bit taller. Yo, what's happening? We're on our first job of three today. It's a, it's a Friday, so they're only small jobs for me. Um, then I'll be heading back to Peaky Land, Wales. So yeah, the, I think the first one we got to do is uh, remove some old cabling outside, tidy that up. I think the next one then is uh, extracting fan. They wanted the timer turned up to 15 minutes. I think the last one is just fitting a track light, which I just picked up from Screwfix. So yeah, we'll get the first job and we'll see you in a minute. I don't know if Tom's told you yet, but he uh, crashed my, well, his van, I guess, my van. But um, yeah, he broke, which, can you remember which wheel it was? That one. So we got some new black rims. So we've done a Pimp My Ride. And now we have black rims. How sexy are those? Yeah. Don't break them again, Tom. Right, so we're at the first job now. So up there is a bunch of old useless uh, cabling, which got to rip out. And the same down here with uh, this cable. I think I'm just going to chuck this one in a box, though, because I don't really know what it does. The same with that, but it all looks old and redundant, so we're just trying to tidy it up a little bit. We'll um, see you back in a minute when I've uh, made the start on it. Right. We now annoy me to screw back with a bayant, so I got a little trick. I got an old Weera Phillips. And what we gotta do, it's like to ruin a screwdriver 101. Put it in there. Like so. And then what you got is a bit that fits. Like ah. Oh. Out to ruin a screwdriver. Meanwhile. Now, while I'm on site, there was something I wanted to share. Now it's a not contentious topic, but about grip filling back boxes in or using anything to fix the box other than a traditional one and a half inch eight and a red wall plug. This here is a classic example of what I'm on about. Now we had to dig this box out and digging out in brick is horrible at the best of times, but we couldn't get a fixing in this wall. 
Because this wall is a single skin, it's, a, it's a unusual, it's a single skin wall, which basically means that by the time I dig the box out, there isn't enough room to put a one and a half inch eight wall plug and screw. There's, just, there's not enough room because you blow through to the other side. So what we've ended up having to do, and this is what I did the other week, I basically just had to grip fill the box in. There was just no other way. You can use like a low expansion foam. I just use grip fill on some of these boxes. And there's many people that are like, and you always see it. I don't know why, I don't know why people say it, but you always see it. And they're like, oh, that will fall out. It's, it's just never gonna, it's never gonna work. It's, you know, it's a terrible way. Well, sometimes we can only use the methods which are available to us and this is a classic example where you just can't use plugs and screws but i'll give you an example of how strong <laughs> once that's set that box just won't come out once it's properly gone off you won't take it out look at that i mean it just won't <laughs> to give you a gauge i mean <sighs> you prop him and the only way you're going to get that out is just to wrench it out with a hammer you know, I mean, that's solid. It just won't go anywhere. So this thing where people say, oh, you know, using grip fall out of four out six months when they tighten up the back plate screws, it won't, it's just no way. Absolutely. No way, <laughs> absolutely no way. So that's the last job done for today. Now we're heading back to the unit. I want to show you a tool back that you know I've used today which are so handy when you're carting your bag about to receive you're carrying SDS, but we'll sort that out about the unit. So yeah, the two jobs are finished. The one was just replacing a light, which we can probably leave a picture up on screen. We couldn't um, record in there, but it is what it is. Nothing special anyway. And then the second one was just replacing an extraction fan because the timer was broken, so it was going straight off when the light would go off. So that's a nice simple one. Extraction fans are always pretty simple, to be fair, as long as you get the similar one that is there already. Yeah, I probably look a bit tired today. That's because me, uh, camera guy and Tom was in the unit till 10 o'clock last night fixing the camera guy's car because he hit the pothole and broke. What's it called a wishbone? Yeah. Wishbone. I was just there for moral support to be honest because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And we had to give to Tom a ring to come and save the day. So cheers for that Tom. Yeah, so someone asked like what it was like working in London uh, the other week. Um, so I'll give you my opinion on it because I've only probably been here was it seven months? Somewhere around seven months now. It's good, it's very full on to be fair. It's very like 100 miles per hour, everyone's on the go. So like we was in Screwfix earlier and um, there was a bit of a queue. And they, everyone's getting so angry in the queue because there was only one person here. And they're like, come on, we're losing money on the job. Well, I'm just here like, you're in London, like what, what, what do you expect? It's, I think I got an expectation of the busy and I expect traffic. So it wasn't too bad when I first came here. But I see the thing that gets me the most about London is parking. It's just so bad. Even if you, sometimes you know you're going to get a ticket, but even the parking somewhere where you're going to get a ticket, you can't even get that either. So I'm walking about 10 miles sometimes to a job. But other than that, yeah, the traffic is just a nightmare. But because I expected it when I come, I don't find it as bad. And um, But for work-wise, yeah, it's great. It's, it's, it is so much work about. It's just so many people. All right, it is a nice place to work. I do enjoy it. So, um, yeah, so if you are thinking about moving to London or something, go for it, go for it. But just have in your head that it is a different world. It is busy. It is, um, you want to keep up with the pace, basically. Like, all right, so Tom, if you're watching this, just click off a minute there. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you guys know, but the truth is Tom's actually bald and he wears a wig. I'm going to leak a photo up on the screen there of it, what he actually looks like without his hair. I go, where do you want me to go, bet? I'm in a yellow box, your sausage. Fine, you, can, you can chill in the yellow box. Fucking assholes. Blendon, rat heads. Oh, I do. Why do you have yellow boxes then? What's all that about? Yeah, anyway, I, didn't get I don't get angry. It's positive all the time, you see. <laughs> um, yeah, so what do we think? Tom looks like bald then. I reckon he should just rock it. Don't worry, take the wig off and just rock bald completely all the time. I reckon if this video gets 3,000 likes. Tom should leave the wig off. Right, so these are the bits I was on about in the van. So these are, how embarrassing. Oh, I can't upside down. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, these are the bits. Um, I got the 5.5 in the drill at the minute. So let me show you. So this is a six mil one at the minute. But what these are great for is, you don't have to carry an SDS around you when you're just doing red plug holes. Um, so I just keep a 5.5 .5 
bit in my bag with my drill on the bag so if I just need to drill a quick hole it's perfect and they're, they're actually really good it was the first time I used them earlier and it just flew through the brick so I highly recommend them and um, just go and buy some to uh, keep in your bag and it saves you kind of going back to that van and getting the SDS and we know we've all been there when we've had to, we've tried to put the SDS 5.5 in this drill and it's like are we so um, yeah go and get yourself a set of them okay now onto this life <laughs> i can't do that with a straight face this light fitting now I, I was really pro this light fitting when we when i took it out of the packet and it was flickering on site and i've just crudely taken the, the plug off the iron just to put it on here 13 out fuse obviously um because i just want to see does this still flicker well yeah i mean it's not flickering like why is that i took out those other i took out two of those and i put in that third floodlight and that third one was all right, so I can only assume, why is that not, oh, see, I don't understand what's happening now. Why is that not flickering now? That is really annoying. What could that mean? Hang on, what could that mean? I put one in, it was flickering, so I took the other one, thinking it was a faulty one, put the second one in, that one was flickering. Then I put a different brand in altogether, and that one wasn't flickering, it was absolutely fine. No, because I know when I connected them, I made so sure that the, the connections were perfect. There was no issues with the connection. So why would they flicker? Okay, this video is, the, I've got to end this video here, but this isn't over. I'm going to take these light fittings back to that job. I'm going to recheck all the connections because I've just plugged that in and it's not flickering now. I take everything back. It appears actually they seem to be quite good quality. So I take everything back. But this is, uh, we're going to be coming back with these uh, next week. You're going to see some more content and we're going to try and get to the bottom of why these were flickering on that job. And I plugged another floodlight in. That wasn't flickering. We'll be back next week. See you in a bit. You see, this is where some of the viewers, see, this is where they mess up, you see, because in the last section where I say, well, right, we're going to end the video here, they click off going back to Pornhub. You see, you guys, a bit of noggin, you see, you stayed behind, you see, you know, yeah. This light fitting, I just thought for the sake of trying, I've just put, uh, it's not the approved method, obviously, but it's uh, good enough just to get a, uh, I wanted to see how much current it actually pulls. And it pulls 0.3 amps, which if you calculate that, that's about 75 watts. So it says it's a 100 watt fitting, but it's actually, the true wattage is about 75 watts. So yeah, and there's no flicker on it, which is bloody irritating, but there you go. I'm going to leave you with some bloopers now, and uh, we'll see you uh, on Friday. So let's see if this one... All right. Shut up, cameraman. Customers just f***ing ass. No, positivity. Positivity. He was like, really? No, that I means know. editing. No, that work for me. <laughs> oh, dear. We love you. Like, subscribe, all that lovely goodness. We love you. It's just such hard work. <laughs> I can't do that. I don't, I'll try again. I could do it. I bet. How's it going, guys? Right now, fresh, 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 fresh. Look at these rims, boy. Why are you coming fast? Let's go around this side of it. Oh, let me grab my bag, actually. Drill bit. There's posy head on it. I don't think that makes no sense. Let me try that again. It's easier to store and it's easier to stop carrying it. I f***ed it up again, man. <laughs>